Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. It's Doug Cunnington here. And in this episode, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. So I'm going to be talking about recreational marijuana just a little bit, a little bit of weed. We're just going to talk about it. And we're also going to do Q&A, like the normal affiliate marketing Q&A. And stick with me on this. I'm trying to rope everybody in because I am gonna, I am going to be talking about affiliate marketing stuff. That is what most people are listening to this for. But we also talk about uh, travel and lifestyle stuff and productivity and some other things. And one of the main reasons I called this The Doug Show is because I wanted to be able to branch out, even though I've kind of really focused on the affiliate marketing stuff because that's the the roots of where I'm coming from and why I started the show. But I branded the show as The Doug Show because I wanted to talk about random stuff in the future and I knew that I was going to be doing that. I could have called it something a little bit more descriptive, something about making money online or affiliate, affiliate marketing, something or other, but I decided to brand it in a general way so that I could do episodes just like this one. So stick with me. I think, uh, I, I'm not trying to convert anyone, but I'm just gonna tell my story. And uh, a few of the questions are indeed related to affiliate marketing. So just stick with me on it. And uh, by the way, if you like, if you dig these episodes, please let me know. I don't get a huge amount of feedback about the show unless I, you know, meet people in person, pin them down and say, hey, did you like this? Did you like that? That sort of thing. Kind of cool. I was able to do that recently in the Atlanta area meetup. I could just ask people, hey, do you enjoy this sort of thing? Do you like YouTube live streams? Do you like it when I do this? Do you hate it when I do that? That sort of thing. So give me some feedback. You know, you can shoot me an email, feedback at doug.show. You can leave me a voicemail. There's a, uh, the phone number is in the description in the show notes. So you could check it out there. So let's talk about marijuana now. So currently, I can just let you know, we'll just skip to the punchline. I live in the Colorado area and Colorado was one of the, I think it was the first state to like decriminalize marijuana. And if I remember right, you know what, I, I did some research earlier, but I don't have it with me right now. It was like 2014, something like that, when it was you know readily available, you could go to a dispensary and just walk up and buy marijuana. Well, I, I never really paid attention, even though I had traveled to Colorado quite a bit. And the reason why is I really didn't enjoy weed at all. Now, um, I, I guess I sort of skipped ahead there, but one thing I, I was going to mention is since I live in Colorado now, um, you literally can go to a store. You, it's very well controlled and uh, you give them your ID. They scan your license. You talk to the, they call it a bud tender. Bud tender is the uh, the terminology. But you talk to a person who works directly with you. They find out what you're interested in, what you want, and then you know they sell it to you. They tax it pretty heavily, from what I could see, and you really can get just um, you know whatever whatever you would like to get. If you want to get something you could smoke, if you want a joint, if you want. Um, some sort of uh, like an edible, which is what I focus on, then uh, you can get it. You just let them know what you're what you're interested in, and you know if you want to relax, if you're trying to de-stress, if you are trying to do some creative work or whatever. So there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance out there, and um, I, I like edibles. All right, so I like edibles. I don't want to smoke anything. I try to be active and athletic and stuff like that. So I don't want to you know smoke anything at all. But the edibles are great, and let me uh, just give you a little history on my relationship with marijuana. So I think maybe in my 20s or so, um, I, I tried to smoke pot a handful of times, right? Maybe five or six, not much. And it was always an awful experience. I didn't know like what what I was smoking exactly or how strong it was, and I I didn't know how long it would take to to hit me. So essentially what would happen is I would I would be drinking, right? So I'd be a little bit buzzed, maybe very drunk on certain occasions, three sheets to the wind perhaps. And then I would 
smoke some and then wait like 10 minutes and I'd say, oh, I can't feel anything. And I didn't have anyone to guide me in a, in a sort of mentor type way. So I would like have another hit or have another hit. And then after an hour, I would just be like knocked on my ass. And I just, I had no concept of what to do or how long it would take or how long it would last or anything like that. So generally I would be knocked on my ass. Maybe I would even like get sick and like, you know, throw up and just feel awful. So it was just a bad experience. And I was like, well, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that anymore. And, um, I just never, never was drawn to it. So it was never enjoyable and not my thing. I tried it a couple of times. I never, I think it was like 25 the first time that I tried it and, um, didn't enjoy it. So fast forward to 2018. So just not that long ago, I went on a trip to Oregon where marijuana is legal. And at the time I was living in Montana, not Colorado. So headed over to Oregon and I saw like dispensaries all over the place. We drove through a lot of small towns and even the very small towns had a dispensary. I was kind of surprised. Didn't didn't really put it all together, but I guess it's sort of not necessarily a franchise, but like a fun small business. So there were there were just dispensaries everywhere. Eventually, I started doing research and I was like, oh, can you just go in and buy it? What's the situation? Do you have to have a prescription or anything like that? Totally ignorant, right? I wasn't paying attention. So I did a little research and went into a store, got some stuff, got a couple like little uh, like chocolate, chocolate pieces. And I know a lot of people may be thinking if you have not experienced this new legal marijuana stuff, then you may not know and you may have a bad impression on like what what edibles are. So basically, if you have that bad impression, it's likely that you experienced, maybe you got a brownie, right, in the past and you did something similar to what I just described in my, you know, uh, my bad experiences in the past where you would have a little bit of a brownie, you didn't know what you were getting, it wasn't... Uh, like specked out and you didn't know how much you were consuming. You didn't know what you were consuming or what it was going to do to you. And you didn't know how long it was going to take. So you potentially overconsumed. It takes longer than you expect most of the time for the marijuana to hit you. So basically with these dispensaries, it's like, it's like a pharmacy almost on each package. It tells you how much exactly is in each one of the little pieces of chocolate. It's very well controlled. So you may be getting like five milligrams of THC in one little chocolate, or maybe it's 10 or something like that. At this point in time, usually they are sort of uh, doses, right? So smaller doses, it's not going to be typical where you'll get like one giant brownie that has like a hundred milligrams. You can get them, but at that point, then you have to like make sure you're cutting it into the right amount and make sure that everyone knows who is going to consume it, exactly what's in there. So everything that I get is like individual servings, usually five to 10 milligrams of THC. And I really like to get the edibles with some CBD, which is legal in all 50 states per my understanding. So you can get... um an edible with THC and CBD. So you get some of the, you know, anti-inflammatory benefits and relaxing benefits from CBD. In addition, the CBD can, and I may get the terminology just a little bit wrong, the CBD sort of mutes or changes the way that the THC interacts with your body. So you may not feel as buzzed from the THC because the CBD is in the mix as well, which is kind of nice because I'm not necessarily like trying to, I mean, I don't want to be like uh, knocked on my ass basically. So with, <laughs> with that said, you can get these doses and it's very exact. It's like taking medicine basically. So I know, hey, if I try you know, five milligrams and I wait for two hours, like after some time, you understand how quick it is to hit you everyone's a little bit different, just like 
alcohol or medicine in general. It's funny, I lump all those together. But basically, I know if I have like a five milligram edible, it may take, you know, 45 minutes and then I'll feel a little bit. And by the way, five milligrams, everyone's different. But for me, five milligrams is maybe like having one beer. So it's it's not much. Um, you can operate normally. You just may feel a little bit more relaxed. I have talked to some other folks and, you know, they do it more for the inebriation and to, you know, blow off steam or whatever. So maybe they have, actually, I talked to one, one of my friends recently and he was like, yeah, basically I do like a 20 milligrams. And I was like, oh, holy crap, that that's quite a lot. Like that must really wipe you out, right? And he was like, yeah, like I do that, uh, you know, I'm not not drinking and I'll just, I'll do that. And it'll really, you know, it'll be like having a, several beers. So anyway, it's very interesting to just have marijuana around where you can try it and it's not, you know, there's no stigma around it anymore, at least in Colorado. And I know, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Georgia right now when I'm recording this and, um, it was only a few years ago (laughs) when you, uh, couldn't buy beer on Sundays here, which is just seems insane to me. It makes no sense. You can buy alcohol on Sunday. And I know many, uh, all states and different uh, localities and stuff, at least here in the U.S., there are many sort of strange laws around alcohol. A lot of times it its origin was with uh, prohibition from a very long time ago. And a lot of those laws stuck around. And then at this point in time, it's really about money. So maybe the alcohol distributors want to have Uh, specific power. So maybe breweries can't sell beer directly to consumers or some odd stuff like that. So a lot of it is just about money and like lobbyists and just the power struggle in alcohol. And I'm sort of losing my train of uh, (laughs) train of thought. But the, the main point is I know there are a lot of states where you can't get marijuana legally, most of them, right? I think there's something like 10 or 12 where it's like decriminalized and, you know, things are moving forward. But um, at this point in time, it's still like unusual, right? But after after you like live in a state where it's legal, you can just go to the store and buy it. I mean, arguably, I believe marijuana is probably like less of an issue, um, less damaging than alcohol. So for me personally, I know that alcohol can really beat up my body, your your liver. You only got one of those, so you got to sort of protect it. And I know actually my in my family, we've had some liver issues. So I, I am very, very aware of that. And in my head, I'm like, well, you know what? I, I do enjoy beer. I'm not uh, you know a crazy drinker like maybe I was in my 20s. And if I maybe have an edible every now and then, and uh, I don't drink as much alcohol, that may actually be better for me. So that's a kind of a weird uh, jump of logic. And hopefully I didn't lose too many people talking about all this stuff. But at this point in time, states are legalizing marijuana. So it is sort of uh, it's sort of coming. It's coming to everybody. And if you're on vacation in Colorado or uh, I think like Washington, California, Oregon, there's a handful of other states that are a little bit more uh, like progressive with their laws. And uh, yeah, generally you could just walk in, show your license, buy what you want. Um, the The bud tenders are shockingly very, very wise about like all the products in there. They know so much. It is insane because you expect them to be sort of a stoner type working at a dispensary. and Maybe they uh, don't know exactly what's going on. But those folks, they must have to take a lot of tests or something like that. Read all this literature. I mean, if you just start explaining what you're looking for, um, they can point you in the right direction. So everybody's super, super helpful. Before we get started with the q and I'll just mention that I'm recording this in the morning, so I am uh, completely sober right now. In fact, I took some uh, nootropics earlier um, for my 
podcast that I'm recording now and some of the other work that I was doing. So I am not stoned. I am not inebriated in any way other than like through uh, nootropics and some coffee that I had earlier. So I know some people were probably thinking about that. (laughs) So if you want to have your question featured, feel free to shoot me an email at feedback or yeah, at this email address. So it's feedback at doug.show or you can leave a voicemail. So these are just some some random ones that we got in. And uh, Jason asked this. So basically, he had a, like, a, basically a site that he was going to do several things on. So he was going to do some affiliate, like Amazon affiliate type marketing and just content based on product reviews. However, he also had an Amazon store. This is, you know, the term that he put around it. He created a storefront that had Amazon products with like thousands of items. And he wanted to know, you know, what I thought about that. And if I thought he'd be able to, you know, make it work. So I advised him to, oh, and I'll throw in one other, other piece. I think Jason also wanted to do some drop shipping as well. So he sent me, you know, all of that together. Amazon affiliate site, an Amazon store that sort of automated and then drop shipping. And he was like, hey, I want to do all this stuff. So number one, I told Jason to not do all those things. I know he was passionate and excited to get started, but I told him, you're trying to start too many new things at once. And just trust me, it's not going to work. I know everyone, uh, everyone thinks they're a little bit special, a little bit smart whatever. You're like, oh, you know, I'll be able to do it even though everyone else seemed to fail. Trust me. It's uh, there's always more kind of shit going on than, than you would expect. And if you're trying to learn new things, you will be confused. So my advice is to just pick one. doesn't matter which one, which, whichever one you want to do, just pick the one, do that thing. Give it, give it some time. Try. You're going to make some mistakes, and what you don't want to do is make a little mistake in each one of the areas. So just focus on one. So probably it'll end up being the Amazon affiliate portion of it. Now, that's just because he was making a little more progress there, and part two is the Amazon store. I told him the Amazon store is probably not going to work. He didn't give me too many details, which I don't, I don't even need them because I've heard this terminology before. So basically, either he's put together a site based on like something like WooCommerce where it pulls data from Amazon and then builds a store around it, or there's other, there's other software out there. I don't think it's as popular, but every now and then I'll see someone who has like a video out there on YouTube and they're like, put together your own e-commerce store with two clicks of a button and you'll have, you know, 10,000 items and all you have to do is get traffic and then they sell it for a hundred bucks and they get all their buddies to sell it. And really it's not going to work at best. At the very best, you will be putting together a store with like thousands of items and you will be publishing like just duplicate content. So you probably will be pulling some of the description from Amazon or something similar. And at best, it's like highly derivative content. At worst, it's duplicate content that is unoriginal. And there's basically no value that you're adding. Someone can go directly to Amazon and just buy the products, get the exact same information, probably more information because at least if they're on Amazon, they can see reviews and maybe a little bit uh, like just more data depending on the product. But at the end of the day, these automated stores are never going to work. So I've never heard of anyone who has bought one of those automated store builder deals and has made money. So if you have, let me know. And then, you know, let me know I'm wrong. And then we can figure out like, where's the value there? Like, why did it work for you? And all that kind of stuff. But from where I sit, I've seen stores or I've seen people who come to me and they're like, hey, I built this store. There's all these products. Why isn't it working? And it's just anyone can do it. If it's super easy for you to put together the store with some piece of shit software, then um, anyone can do it and it's probably not going to work. So if anything's super easy and you can do it in like 15 minutes, then uh, it's not going to work. So just keep that in mind. 
whether it's Amazon affiliate stuff or some other area, if it's some Shopify store or something like that, if it's super easy and anyone can do it, then you're not adding much value and it's probably not going to be like a long-term play at all. And finally, I mentioned the little drop shipping thing. Um, drop shipping is fine. You know, I know there's some people who do like high dollar drop shipping and it's just another business model. It's totally valid. There's a, you know, hundreds, thousands of ways to make money online. I talk about like a specific flavor of Amazon affiliate marketing. Other people do display ads or whatever. Maybe they sell info products or do courses or whatever. There's a ton of ways to you know, make money and start a business and work on a side project and all that stuff. And there's no like specific, like right way to do it. There's a lot of options and there's probably a few ways that are just not going to work. And one of them is those automated Amazon stores. And the other is like, if you're, if you're just thinking, Hey, I'm going to try all these different business models for like one month each, you're just going to make beginner mistake after beginner mistake in each one of the areas. So whatever you pick, just make sure you give yourself enough time to learn, not make the same mistakes over and over again, and you know, move beyond the beginner mistakes that inevitably you will make them. It's just normal. I mean, you, you learn from those mistakes. You just got to try not to make them again and again. Next question is from Denise. And I've been asked this uh, recently by a few people, so I knew it was important to cover. So Denise asked this. I was wondering if you could talk about how long to use the keyword golden ratio. Is there a best practice? Should I exhaust my keyword golden ratio list for primary and secondary words and then move on to higher competition keywords? And it's like, what do you do after you get started, basically? When, when are you able to move on to bigger volumes, bigger keywords, more profitable keywords in general? And um, basically, you can do whatever you want. Um, so it's very interesting because I, I think going after the long tail using the keyword golden ratio is 100% valid for a new site. It's a great way to get traffic when you're in the sandbox period, when your site is under six months old. Additionally, if you have a site where you want to start boosting the traffic and you have not yet used the KGR, it's a great way to just start publishing content where you know you can get some traffic. Probably not going to be like a huge home run in general because the search volumes are low. But if you are trying to, for example, you bought a site and you're like, all right, Let's uh, let's just try and get more traffic. Let's try and get some love from Google and make some sales. The KGR is a great approach. So in general, anytime that you want to publish content that is targeting higher search volume terms, it is just fine. Even if your site is under six months old, right? Even if you are in the sandbox, publishing that content is fine. It'll take a little bit longer to rank most likely, and it will potentially require some backlinks and some other promotion, and um, you can rank over time. And by the way, I think there's a little bit of a misconception. In fact, I've had people um, talk to me, email me and say, hey, you know what? I'm actually, I'm not using the KGR for everything. I'm actually publishing other content that's going after like bigger search volume terms. And uh, that's just a total misconception. I literally publish a lot of content that is not KGR compliant. The keyword golden ratio is just a tool that we can use. And if you use the right tool for the right thing, then it can be uh, very valuable. If you're using the, the wrong tool on something, then it's not very useful just doesn't quite make sense and you'll end up wasting your time a little bit. But um, in general, I think if you're looking to grow your site and, you know, go after a long-term, a long-term uh, sort of project, then yeah, go for, go for a bigger term. It may be something where, you know, you publish one very excellent piece of content for, per month, right? Let's flip this on its head. I talk about publishing a lot of content, but what if you flip it over. Look at um, Brian Dean and Backlinko, for example. There's not that many posts over on Backlinko. 
there is very high quality content and Brian has spent a lot of time promoting that content. So again, let's flip it over on its head. Let's say you just publish one post per year, not year, 12 posts per year, one per month. That's what I meant. So one per month, and let's say it's 4,000 words, very high quality, very well written, and you spend the rest of your time promoting the content. Probably you'll be able to make some traction. I mean, just imagine if you're spending all the resources and capital on promotion versus publishing, you know, 200 articles. And part of it's my fault. You know, I, I came out with some nice case studies to demonstrate the power of the keyword golden ratio, but I get probably one or two emails per week. Someone's like, hey, I'm gonna I'm publishing 200 articles. I'm starting my my project on publishing 200 KGR articles or 300 or I found 400 keywords and and I'm gonna you know start publishing this month or whatever. And they they are taking massive action, but it's like, okay, wh- like why are you doing it? Are you doing it just because that's what I did? And you're you're gonna like try to recreate that. You may have to, you know, work on it at your own speed. Maybe you don't need to publish 200. Maybe you should publish 20 and then work on some promotion. That's what I recommend, by the way, or or 10 or something like that. But working on 200, um, you have to know like the the checkpoints that you should pause and reevaluate how things are going versus like just looking at the goal, 200 posts and just blindly going that direction. By the way, when I was publishing the 200 post on that, uh, you know, first time I was really stress testing the KGR, it was over the course of five months. And I had like, you know, every two weeks I was like evaluating where I was at. Am I seeing the results that I expect? How is the team doing? Can, should we publish more? Like how much money are we making? So there, there were a lot of checkpoints along the way that, uh, you know, that's fairly nuanced. I don't even know if I shared all those little details out there. Uh, Definitely not in a public way. But anyway, the point is, if you want to publish some content that is not keyword golden ratio compliant, that is cool. Go for it. Probably need to spend a little more time promoting and getting some backlinks and making sure, you know, the world knows that piece of content is out there. And it may take you a little while which is fine, by the way. One interesting thing is like, because it takes a while to rank a higher competition post instead of keywords, it takes longer. But once you're in a high position, usually you have some staying power, which is super cool. So once you, you know, if it takes a year and a half to move from, I'm just going to make something up here. If it takes like a year and a half to go from like position 18 to position number two or one, then you're probably going to be able to stay there for a while. So keep that in mind. It may take a lot of work. It may take a long time, but you'll have some staying power, which is very, very valuable. And it makes you feel more secure. You know, it feels good. Now, one cool thing, this is a little bit of a tangent here, like we do. If you have a lot of KGR content, then it's highly likely that that KGR content will serve as a buffer for algorithm changes. So basically, instead of your site following a normal 80-20 where a few posts get most of the traffic, the majority of the traffic, with the KGR, it's highly, highly likely that you will have a very long tail spread of traffic so maybe your highest traffic page is only getting like two to 3% of the overall traffic. So even if that page takes a hit and say loses 30% of its traffic, for example, it's only 30% of the 3%, which is quite a small percentage versus if you had a post, for example, and it was getting like 20% of your traffic and then you lost a third of that, that's kind of a big hit. You're going to notice that. It's going to hit your bottom line pretty hard. 
So the cool part with the KGR is it kind of buffers um, any huge changes because, you know, your site just doesn't follow a normal 80-20 like we would expect to see. However, right, there's pros and cons. There's always pros and cons. So the con to that is if you, for example, were doing some CRO, that's conversion rate optimization, then it would be a little bit harder to implement changes because you would you would have uh, potentially a lot more pages to update, a lot more URLs to go and optimize. So you instead of uh, you know in a standard scenario, let's say you have a hundred posts and um, you figure out CRO via A/B testing, and you're like, okay, here's the best practice. Instead of updating, you know. 20 of your posts and getting the majority of the benefit, you would potentially have to update all 100 or 80 of them or whatever to capture most of the traffic. So that said, there's more overhead just by having more content. So there's always trade-offs that that could be sort of a small trade-off. I mean, at the point where you have identified what the best practice is for your site to optimize those conversions, then it's really just a a manpower problem where you have to put the time in and spend the time like making all the changes. So hopefully everyone followed me on that sort of it's, uh, feel like a diagram would have been nice to describe that. So hopefully I made my point via audio here. The next email here is sort of a, uh, it's a thank you and success story. And it's something we we're, I guess I mentioned it a few weeks ago on the show and uh, it's from Evan and Evan was thanking me for using the keyword golden ratio and sharing it. Evan's making um, basically a hundred bucks a day. So he's making about $3,000 per month or so. And his goal in 2020 is to hit five or 6,000 per month. And, you know, I let him, I gave him a heads up that I I mentioned him in the show and he was like, yeah, totally, but I had already recorded it. So he gave me a a quick little follow-up and I'm going to mention this too. So number one, he was like, hey, you can can plug my SEO agency and it's called SearchWise Media. So you can Google it, check it out. So thanks, Evan, for mentioning that. And, uh, and he, you know, he was, he was nice about it. He was like, you got to mention it, but Here's the cool part. So Evan is a 10-year veteran in digital marketing and he founded two digital marketing agencies. And he's been he's been working on passive income for like 12 years, but the KGR is literally what finally enabled him to start earning from Amazon affiliate sites. He's had some success with uh, CPA marketing. I think that is a uh, cost per acquisition. It's sort of like lead generation if I understand it correctly. And he's also done well with Google AdSense and some e-commerce sites and drop shipping, just light success. But Amazon affiliate income has been elusive for years. And then he found me and the keyword golden ratio and everything is coming together. So here's the cool part. He started with a KGR in February of 2019. So he's not even a year in. And he has already hit the $3,000 per month mark. And there's a high chance. I don't think Evan has experienced a retail season. I would expect um, potentially in December, which is the month which I am recording this, I wouldn't be surprised if he hit his five or six thousand dollar mark that he's aiming for. Now it may decline, you know, after the retail season, but I've often seen November have a you know pretty huge increase over October, and then December will be even higher, even higher than November. So it kind of, kind of uh, will it will shock you to be honest with you because like you're going along, you're doing, you're doing this work on your website for a while. You see some growth, you're feeling good. And, you know, revenue will, will jump from a hundred to 500 to 1800 in over like month over month when you're in a growth period. Then when you hit the retail season, people just buy a lot of stuff on Amazon and they're filling up their cards. They're buying a lot of gifts. They're sending things out. Like, it just grows a little bit faster than we can imagine. And it's based on like the experience that we've had 
we're going along for months and things are just going slowly. It seems like nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, bam, you're just making a hundred bucks a day or 500 bucks a day or whatever. So um, I encourage people, especially if you're like in the early stages of your site, or maybe you haven't like connected all the dots quite yet, like keep pushing, like keep trying to like tweak what you're doing and uh, continue to like push on. A lot of times we're like really close to like making it work and uh, you know, don't, don't give up. Like one, one other cool thing again, to go on a tangent here is I'll hear people that enrolled in the five figure niche site course. They did, you know, 10 or 12 weeks of work. They launched their site. They published the content. They did a little bit of promotion, maybe some blog commenting and started making like 10 or $15 a month. Then I'll get an email from them a year and a half later, for example, or two years. They say, Hey, you know what, Doug, I wish I would have worked on my site more. It's making $150 a month and I haven't touched it since I enrolled in 2017. And um, it's just slowly been getting more traffic. The conversions are good. And um, I'm starting to add more content to it now, now that I'm making a you know significant amount of money. And if you think about it, you know, sometimes these folks spent the uh, you know, six hundred dollars on enrolling in the course or whatever. And, um, you know, they spent some time on their site, but over the course of the two years, they've more than paid for the course. Right. And it's, it's kind of amazing. And it's kind of, uh, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy that the content in the course works. And I, I guess I created it in a way that it's sort of evergreen. Right. So there are some pieces, sometimes the, the tools change, um, Sometimes the tools are no longer in existence or they work in a completely different way and I need to recommend a different tool, but it's really about the, the principles and the, and the way you're approaching, like building the site, why you're doing certain things. And at that point, it doesn't matter which keyword research tool you use. It's like, you can use any keyword research tool, just, you know, it needs to give you a a couple pieces of data, like the search volume, for example. So Anyway, keep at it. If if you haven't if you haven't connected all the dots yet, keep at it. Keep trying to publish more content. F- try and figure out like what issues you may have, and uh, you know fix them and don't make those mistakes again. We got one more question coming up, and it'll be from Bryce. But before we get to that, I'll, I'm going to go back to the uh, the marijuana stuff here, and. I think it's interesting to note that there's many different like strains of marijuana out there. So even with edibles, you can get some that will make you really relaxed make you sleepy. Some are going to make you like a little more creative and give you a little bit of energy. In fact, I've had, um, I can't remember the brand, but um, there's an edible brand out there that is very good chocolate, by the way, it doesn't taste anything like uh, danky or anything like weed. Tastes very good, very high quality chocolate, but they have some that give you more energy, right? So it actually has like caffeine, some other sort of stimulant, and then a strain of marijuana that actually stimulates your uh, you know, creativity, or at least it doesn't make you sleepy, right? It has uh, caffeine in there. Then another one is like I think it's called like sleep and it has um, a strain in there that is a, I think it's an indica uh, and has some other herbs and things that relax you and it will make you very sleepy. And it's, it's so interesting. It's like, it's like having uh, like the right thing at the right time has a huge impact. Right. So those, those times where I was like, uh, you know, hoping I'd get a great night's sleep. Well, the, the sleep, the sleep blend really helped. It was great. And then the other times where I was like, all right, let's see, let's see what this stuff with the caffeine does. I'll have it, you know, during the day just to see like how it, you know, not while I'm driving or any kind of crazy stuff like that. But um, yeah, if I'm just like, all right, I'm going to go hike around or something like that, do something safe. Um, and by, by the way, these are all very small doses. I, I'm very, I'm very uh, like, aware of how much I'm taking. Obviously you gotta, you can't, you can't just uh, do whatever, whatever you want. So, um, 
basically, yeah. Check out the edibles. If you're if you're in one of the states where it's legal, check it out. If you're not, you know, ignore all, all that I said. But if you're on vacation or you should go on vacation to one of these states where it's legal and see what all the fuss is about. Because it's really, it's just, it's strange that it, um, it's taken so long for marijuana to become, uh, you know, decriminalized in certain areas. And um, yeah, I can go on and on. So like I said earlier, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, it'd be interesting to um, hear from you because I have no gauge if some people are going to think I'm out of my mind for talking about it, but that is part of the cool thing where I don't have like, uh, you know, I got to I got, uh, you know, no sponsors, right? So, um, or at least I have some shows that are not sponsored. So I can talk about whatever I'd like and ramble on and ramble on. Okay, so let's get to this other question from Bryce. I'm going to generalize it a little bit because he gave a little bit of uh, sort of detailed information. So Bryce, thanks for this question and for putting the uh, time to think about, you know, phrasing this in the right way. I really appreciate that. So, Bryce says this, thanks for all the amazing content you're putting out there. I've been using the niche site process PDF to create my first site and I'm finishing up on my first 10 posts. It's um, kind of in the medical zone. All right. So I'm sort of genericizing it. So imagine it's kind of medical, but not exactly. So Bryce's question is this, I don't have any formal medical training or a background in anything related to it. So the majority of the posts have some information as a novice and he's including sources as needed. It's clearly stated in the terms page that nothing should be taken as medical advice and to seek out professional advice first. But you also have, or should I also put a disclaimer on all the posts saying the same thing? Bryce says, I know you're not a lawyer, but maybe you could point me in the right direction. So number one, I think having the disclaimer like on a, an about page is good. I think having it on each page is probably a smart thing to do as well. I don't think that you like from an FTC standpoint, that's the Federal Trade Commission. It's not like you have to say, hey, I'm earning a commission is it's not similar to that but at the same time i think my my bigger point my my bigger takeaway is i personally probably wouldn't be operating in a medical or they call it your money or your life type niche like financial advice where google is potentially more stringent on your expertise and your experience and all that stuff it's worth it to note that Yes, there are probably many products that are considered maybe in the medical area, but maybe you don't necessarily need to have like expertise and you could still rank your site. The trend that I've seen from Google over the past few years is just leaning harder and harder on the expertise and the authority and just people being qualified to talk about certain topics. So I would still steer clear of it sounds like you're, you know, already starting, but you're in the early, you're in the early stages, Bryce, where you have like 10 pieces of content. So maybe you finish up your work on launching the site and maybe, right, look at some other niches that are not in that area where maybe you're on the hit list with Google. I know there are a lot of sites that are kind of related to medical or kind of related to financial advice, but not exactly. You may be just fine. At the same time, it could be one of the other, uh, basically other niches that are going to be impacted in the future. That's not necessarily a way to like make a decision because I'm, I'm scared of it, right? So you have to look at what you're trying to do. And I know for a fact there are some niches where it does seem slightly medical related. And I've seen people like really crush it really fast because it's like an untapped niche. Maybe they're on the early side of the growth curve and they're able to hop in there, be 
one of the first movers, right? One of the first people in the space and they get, they get a lot of traction and then they develop the authority because of that. So there's a few different ways you could take it. And basically to answer your specific question, I think having the main disclaimer page is going to be okay, Bryce. And then further, if you do put a little disclaimer somewhere like on each page, that is probably helpful. One thing that I can add in here, and I've seen some people do this um, in the last year and a half or so since the medic and EAT type updates have come around. Basically, you can hire a editor who is qualified in that specific topic. So if it's medical related or law related, you can have a lawyer write it. That sounds expensive, but the point is you can get people that are qualified in certain areas that do have the certification and you can note that. Maybe you don't have them write the content, but maybe you have them review the content so at least that it's been reviewed by like an editor-in-chief who happens to be a doctor, thus giving the whole site like more authority, more I guess expertise and the certifications are in place or if the person has a a law degree or a medical degree that can be noted as well. So just you I mean you could be creative and figure out like even if you're not qualified maybe you can have the expert eye of someone else um so that it does have that level of trust overall. So just just a thought and you I mean you could probably take those similar ideas and apply it so that, you know, it fits for different niches, different sites, um, and, you know, figure out a way to put your own spin on it so that your site does have that expertise that you want it to have. I want to thank everybody for sending all the emails my way. It's uh, kind of funny. I'm looking through the emails that I have on my phone here and there are so many great shout outs and I, I sort of get behind on all these emails and um, I appreciate hearing stuff. So I think I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on this particular email in a future episode, but I just wanted to thank everybody for for sending out these emails and like, you know, complimenting me, right? So I, I love to get those. So this is from Kyle. And like I said, this is just gonna be like a bit of a teaser. So Kyle says this, I wanted to reach out and let you know that I love your content and really enjoy the podcast. I hope you continue to keep it focused on the beginner to intermediate information. I think a lot of people enjoy it. I used to listen to Pat Flynn as well, but his podcast isn't relevant to me so much any longer. And Kyle said this too. So sorry for rambling. I'll get to the point. I emailed you last year around October or November of 2018 with a few questions about the KGR. You were so helpful. Thanks for that. It's been almost one year since I started using the KGR method and tracked all the posts I published. Some were compliant while some were not and some were like zero search volume terms. I tracked the main keywords as well to the overall page and holy shit, bro, your KGR method is amazing. So essentially... (laughs) He's He has over a million clicks to his site over the course of the year. So that is a lot of traffic, my friends. He has something like 27 million or more, or I guess it's 27.4 impressions. And you can see there's a couple like little stair steps where like the traction caught and he started getting a lot more traffic and you can see various algorithm updates and things are going great. So KGR, my friends, it works really well. And um, yeah, we may go a little bit deeper into some of these details in in the future, but uh, thanks Kyle for sharing it. And if you have a similar story, it's always cool to see those things. Uh, People are quite generous with sharing some of the results, which is cool. And I am, uh, I generally seems to be very apparent to me now is I do a bad job like tooting my own horn in those cases. Now it's cool because I'm sure other people like when it's starting to work, they are telling other people about the keyword golden ratio. And I know that because um, I hear from individuals who just say like, yeah, my friend said they were doing this. They told me to check out your stuff and here I am. So 
It's very cool. Thanks, folks, for letting me know about that stuff. A couple other cool episodes that are going to be coming up in the future. So you may have noticed I've been doing a few solo episodes, and it's due to some travel and family sickness, and just my my plans kind of got flipped upside down for the fourth quarter in a serious way. So I had to regroup a little bit. People are also busy, so I haven't been doing as many interviews, but looking to have uh, John Dykstra from Fat Stacks blog back on some, Ron Stefanski, my good buddy. We have some very interesting topics to go over with Ron. Um, I, I talk to him pretty often as we we have a small mastermind group of just the two of us. So we have been getting together and just chatting, talking shop over the last um, almost two years now. So we've been we've been chatting for a while. He's been on the show a couple times already. And yeah, we have some pretty cool topics to discuss. One, I'll just give you a little teaser here. So uh, one is he was exchanging emails, we think, with the real Mark Cuban out there. So um, we'll, we'll talk about emailing people <laughs> and a good way to approach folks. Further, he launched a site at this point in time, I think it was about eight months ago, and uh, he had kind of a slow start, to be honest with you. However, he knows how to build a site, how to get some backlinks and publish content that people are interested in. So he is at this point getting like, I think he said five to 700 visitors a, to per day, five to 700 visitors per day to this site that is about eight months old, which is pretty cool. Very, very cool. And um, yeah, we have a couple topics um, to cover with Ron. And now uh, one thing, just uh, tons of tangents on this one, as I'm just talking, I'm thinking of more stuff, but I was chatting with Ron the other day and he was like, Hey, do you got any books to recommend to me? And, um, there were, there were a couple that I really enjoyed just off the top of my head and Ron Ron's making it a goal to, to read more. So, or at least listen to audio books, I think is his gonna, is going to be his uh, format as audio books. And um, I recommended two Charles Duhigg books. So The Power of Habit, which is really, really good book. Um, there's a lot of actionable stuff. And Charles Duhigg has um, a journalism background. So there's a lot of like like personal stories in there, or not his stories, um, but there are stories about people. So there's some like personal aspect in there that you can connect to. So it's not just like a string of facts or anything like that. And then his book, I think it's called Better, Faster, Smarter, and it's a productivity book. Very good book as well. In both of those, there's a small section in the back. It's maybe like maybe 10 to 20 pages of like applying what you learned in the book. So very fun reads, very fast reads. And I I, I love both of those. I have the I have the like printed book, the physical copy of each one of those. And then a few of the other books I recommended were Malcolm Gladwell books. So easy for me to recommend these. These are all like New York Times bestsellers. So it's kind of a, a known quantity. These are good writers. They have very good uh, like credentials. And basically, it's easy to recommend these. So uh, the Malcolm Gladwell books that I really enjoyed, Outliers, Tipping Point, two of my favorites. Uh, Blink is very good as well. Recently, I actually listened to Malcolm Gladwell's most recent book, and it is called um, Talking with Strangers, if I remember right. I didn't like it as much, but I, I've only listened to it once. Um, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting for a lot of reasons, but I think Outliers and The Tipping Point sort of. I guess, captured my interest a little bit more. So anyway, if you've read any good books in the last year, listen to them, shoot me an email, let me know. Let me know uh, books that I should check out. So we're gonna end it here now, folks. So everybody have a great day out there. The time that this is gonna be published is around the holidays and new year and all that stuff. So hopefully you and your family are having a, you know, happy holidays, Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever it is you celebrate, or if you don't celebrate anything, hope you're enjoying this time of the year and we'll catch you on the next episode.
Thank you so much for listening to The Doug Show. I really do appreciate it. I mean, I'm just sitting here on my computer recording stuff, and uh, you're listening to it, and I think that's awesome. If you enjoy the show and you know someone who maybe would be interested in it, please let them know. I think it would be fantastic if you help spread the word. If you are not signed up for the Niche Site Project email list, well, you're in luck. All you have to do is go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, enter your name and email address, and I'll send you a bunch of cool stuff about affiliate marketing, productivity, including all my templates. If you happen to not be subscribed to this podcast, please do subscribe. And don't forget, I welcome your questions. So you could send uh, your emails to feedback at doug.show. I got that really cool domain, doug.show, that's it. So feedback at doug.show. Or I'm going to leave my voicemail number in the show notes. So all you have to do is give me a buzz, leave a voicemail, and then I'll potentially put you on the air. So looking forward to it and we'll catch you next time.